You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. A new report has revealed that nearly 5 million people in Britain don't earn enough to maintain a decent standard of living. Their incomes fall below the level set as the UK living wage by the prominent think tank, the Centre for Research in Social Policy. It says £7.20 is the minimum needed for those in work to support themselves. The figure is higher for London, standing at £8.30. A new report from accountancy firm KPMG has found that 20% of workers in the UK are paid less than those levels. Nearly 90% of waiters and bar staff are not paid the living wage. This rate is voluntary, unlike the national minimum wage, the amount that employers must pay by law, that's set at £6.19 an hour for those aged 21 and over. A separate report from the Confederation of British Industry says that employers need to take a cautious approach to the wages they pay their staff. The CBI says that in the current economic climate, pay restraint is set to continue to protect employment. Meanwhile, anti-poverty activists say the legal minimum wage is far too low. They want the living wage to be adopted by all employers. But can the country afford it? Joining us for a discussion on the living wage is Mike Kelly. He's the author of the Living Wage Report and the head of corporate social responsibility for KPMG. Stephanie Liss is communications officer at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And John Page is the national organiser at the TSSA Union, which represents people working in transport and travel. Uh, I'll begin with you, Mike Kelly, um, the author of the Living Wage Report. Should we be adopting the living wage? The report itself sets out the size of the challenge for the UK, and there are two aspects to it. The first aspect is the use of the Office of National Statistics Survey, which um, sets out the numbers and the occupations that you've described. And it also gives you a regional variation, so you've got a heat map for where employees are paid less than the living wage across the UK. Um, the second piece of research actually looks at the financial confidence of people, so how they feel about such as major purchases if they are being paid above or below the living wage. Um, we're not advocating that every single person should be paid the living wage from today. Um, what we have said is that it's worthwhile for businesses to consider whether they can afford to pay the living wage and not just treat it as a linear discussion around uh, two different wage rates. Sure. Stephanie Liss from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I think it's very encouraging um, that companies and organisations such as KPMG are looking at a living wage. Um, I think, you know, it's very important for employers to consider their employees' well-being. My main, I think my main concern is an issue of productivity, and I think that's the acid test when it comes to a living wage. I mean, someone that gets paid in London £8.30 an hour now is, for whatever reason, judged to be more productive than someone that earns a national minimum wage. If we saw the implementation, well, obviously not ma mandatory, but if it came into force, it might actually have a knock-on effect, as those already on £8.30 an hour will have to earn more. And at the, you're sort of in the midst of quite a large recession, I think pay hikes are going to lead to job losses, and that's what we have to be concerned about when we have nearly well, over 950,000 unemployed young people at the moment in the UK. And John Page from the TSSA Union. Well, I think in a modern economy such as the UK, we should be ashamed that there's so many people who can be working full-time and, and do not have a living wage. Now, I, I take issue with Stephanie on, on one point. I don't think uh, people who are on below the living wage are unproductive. I think it's about economic muscle that many of these people, cleaners, bar staff, etc., simply don't have the ability to exert influence over their employers to get a living wage. What's wonderful about the Living Wage campaign, which London citizens initiated, I'd like to say it was a trade union initiative, but it wasn't, it was a community initiative. And what's wonderful about it is that they've mobilised communities to say to employers like KPMG, who adopted the living wage because the London citizens engaged with them and said, we, we think you should be doing this, and it's good for your business. And after several years of paying the living wage, they've come back and said, you, you know what, you were right. It is good for business. And there's plenty of statistics that show that when employers adopt the living wage, absenteeism falls, recruitment and retention, they get huge benefits from, so people stay with them and the, the staff are more productive. So it makes sense from a business point of view. But in a modern industrial society, 
I, I, I repeat, it's an absolute disgrace. John, how much of a difference does the living wage make for employees? Well, I mean, I think it's about whether you can take the, cin the children to the cinema or wh whether you can take them out for a treat very often. I mean, the reality, of course, is that most people who are on less than the living wage end up having to work two jobs. Uh, and people sometimes are working two full-time jobs and then taking extra work as well, just to get enough money to be able to keep their families. And that, that's not appropriate. If, for example, an employer judges that, you know, for whatever reason, they can afford to pay £7 an hour to employ someone, they don't have the money to pay someone higher than that, then that's extinguishing the job. The problem with the living wage, I think, is that it will privilege those already inside the job market, but will actually create problems for those outside of it. You know, a lot of small, you know, if take for the electronics industry, lots of big companies are doing very well and may be able to implement this, but what about the small businesses that are losing out to outsourcing internationally? They're not going to be able to afford to pay staff anything, so those people outside the market will lose out completely. I think one of the um, strongest lessons we've learned from paying the living wage for more than six years now, and um, you're right, you know, we first engaged with London Citizens in March 2006. Uh, we have been proclaiming every year since that it's good for business, so it's not just this week, um, the, uh, the biggest intangible value that it has created is a completely different dialogue between um, KPMG and its suppliers and the supply chain. And um, I know you'd think this was a plan, but purely, you know, the, the second last email before I came over this morning was um, about the, the tender for the cleaning services, and it said, um, this is the manager within the firm who runs that. He said, for me, the acid test for me was the recent UK cleaning tender. This time of change and uncertainty for the cleaning, uncertainty for the cleaning operatives and when they have to decide whether to remain with their current employer or to be across to a new employer and thereby remain with KPMG. He said, I'm really pleased to report the vast majority, if not all, have chosen to stay, thereby providing the firm with continuity, reduced training cost and minimal impact to the operation effectiveness. And that is all about the trust between the cleaning contractors and um, their staff. So I do take your point about the, you know, the potential for loss of employment. Um, and if you look at it you know, historically, the, the same argument was put forward at the introduction of the national minimum wage. But if other employers do adopt the living wage, that doesn't give KPMG much competition then, does it? Well, ultimately, you know, in this area, we would lose our competitive advantage because we have, you know, we are able to attract the best um, supply chain cleaners, security people and uh, catering teams. Um, so ultimately, yes, when it goes mainstream and everyone's paying it, then we will lose our competitive advantage. But it's the same as fair trade. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. Joining us in the studio is Mike Kelly, the author of The Living Wage Report. Stephanie Liss is from the Institute of Economic Affairs. And John Page is from the TSSA Union. <laughs> Stephanie Liss from the uh, Institute of Economic Affairs. It's all very well that KPMG can afford to pay these higher wages, but not every company can. Well, that's my real concern, to be honest, because I think the real poverty that lies in this country isn't with those that are in work, it's with those who have... Who aren't, in, who, who aren't in work. And I think the living wage won't actually do anything to improve the chances of those that are currently unemployed. I mean, as I said before, I think it's really encouraging and really great that companies like KPMG can do it. But there's a great deal, a considerable amount of small businesses that would be able to lose out. And as bigger companies are forced to pay more, those who aren't as skilled or maybe not as productive might get, you know, they're going to get forced into self-employment, maybe the black market, maybe smaller businesses, and the pay in those is going to be forced down a result of the living wage going up elsewhere. So, I mean, I just don't, I'm, I'm just not convinced that it's, you know... No, I disagree, really. I, I can't see how um, spreading the living wage can lead to other people getting lower wages. What, what I would say, though, and it's on a slightly different point, is that if we tolerate low wages, what we're effectively doing is saying that the government, and thereby taxpayers, should be subsidising those employers at the margins, because those people who are living on the minimum wage are undoubtedly going to require housing benefit and other benefits, because they can't afford housing. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you're effectively arguing. If you, if, you, if you oppose a living wage, you're saying actually the government should subsidise low wages by, by, by backfilling with benefits. And that seems to me to be a very, very 
strange way to operate. My general concern, you know, with five million people below a living wage mm. is the cost of living in this country. I mean, you know, OK, we have a separate rate for London, but we're not taking into account the disparities in the cost of living between, for example, Bradford and Bournemouth. In Bournemouth, it costs as much, to, almost as much to live in London. And, you know, they're still getting the same amount of pay as someone that lives where it's well, much cheaper. to be fair, actually, the, the research that's been done out of Loughborough did look at all the regional variations, and Manchester have done a separate review. They concluded that for Manchester as a regional pay rate for a living wage, using the same definition of what makes a living wage. They came out at £7.19 okay. and they well, adopted the national living wage and the Poverty Alliance have done something similar in Scotland as well. Okay, well fine, maybe yeah. let's take the example of to live in a town as opposed to live in a rural area. Yeah. Up to August last year, the inflation in real terms to live in the countryside was 7.7% compared to 4.3% in cities. That's an extra £2,000 in, in, in the, mm. the £2,000 difference between the cost of living in the countryside as opposed to living in towns. I mean, that's quite a big change. And I, don't, I think it's quite arbitrary to just look at a living wage in fairly simple, I think it's quite simplistic. I think what we, you know, as a country, what we need to be doing is really focusing on how much it costs the family to live. I mean, by 2015, gas bills will get, our gas bills have risen 10% in real terms. Domestic electricity has risen 26%, a result of government policies to try and tackle climate change. That's simply not sustainable and not affordable now. We need to put, be putting more money in people's pockets by avoiding schemes like this and looking well, well, to... Perhaps we could put more money in people's pockets by getting more employers to adopt the living wage. I mean, I think what's interesting, um, speaking to uh, Mike from KPMG, is that the relationship between employer and employee changes. Mm. It, it is... I think that's, um, yeah, that's a really strong point because um, the, the, the danger is, and, and the, to you know, be quite candid, the first time we looked at this... The board said to a colleague and myself, you know, what will it cost us to pay the living wage? And um, the, the biggest cost was in management time working out who we were employing at the moment, whether they were direct employees or third party contractors. This is, this is yeah. all for KPMG though, but can other employers such as small oh, companies sure. pay yeah. higher wages without having higher costs? It's easier for me to use KPMG examples. I think the easiest thing for everyone is if you look on the living wage website um, and um, as has already been you know, pointed out Citizens UK started campaigning in this more than 10 years ago there are plenty of um, smaller businesses and I think you know the more challenging is for you know the, the third sector for charities to say that they're going to pay the living wage and there are um, plenty of um, charities large and small quite a few think tanks as well, actually, um, who have said that they're paying the living wage. I mean, we've got Living Wage Week starts on Sunday. Um, the mayor will announce the new rates on Monday. He will also announce um, all of the new accredited employers. And I would you know, suggest that you know, people have a look at that list there and you will find a business that is similar to your own. Stephanie Liss, isn't there also an argument, a moral argument here, that we have a responsibility to pay our lowest paid workers a bit more? I'm not going to bring morale. I'm not going to start sort of discussing morality. To be honest, my issue is affordability, and the, it, essentially, it comes down to the fact that not every business business can afford to do this. And but is there not a morality issue there that we should be paying le the lowest paid workers a bit more money? Well, the lowest paid workers have get paid the minimum wage. I mean, we're not, I'm not here to discuss the morality behind the issue. I, I want to discuss the economic impact of it, which is essentially that you know it's just not affordable for everyone, and it will have a knock-on negative effect on those outside the labour market. See, I, I don't think you can discuss the economic implications and divorce that from the moral implications. Um, in the industry that I organise, I think Brian Souter from Stagecoach took home in revenue himself £250 million last year. The privatisation of lots of our public services, including the railway and, and the bus, has seen people become very, very rich. But at the same time, they've often gone through a process of outsourcing their cleaners their security guards and other other staff, kitchen and catering staff and so on, who have then had their pay cut to the absolute minimum that the companies can afford in the belief that actually that's the way to run an effective business. A, a race to the bottom for our economy. And I don't, I don't think we can say we can't afford a living wage for people who work in this country unless you engage in a moral argument because you're making moral judgments. You're saying it's fine for the people at the very top to be earning vast fortunes 
even though the people at the very bottom can't afford to pay their rent at the end of the week despite working full time. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I was just, I mean, okay, we're talking about the morality of people getting, you know, that, that um, employers are going to lose staff and go out of business because of things like this because they wouldn't be able to afford it. If you wanted to implement a universal living wage, a lot of companies can't afford to pay that. As I said before, if an employer can afford £7 to employ someone an hour and then has to employ them £7.20, they can't afford that. The employer's going to lose out, which is going to have a knock-on bad effect on him, as well as his employees. Well, let me tell you this. I think it's actually low-wage jobs that drive good quality jobs out of business. And certainly in the travel trade, if you look around, you'll find that the travel companies that actually maintain a decent wage for their staff are the ones who are under most pressure because they're being undercut by fly-by-night firms paying the absolute minimum wage to their staff. No training, no development, none of, none of that, no career progression. They're there, they're, they're like a commodity their staff and they're gone and those companies are the ones that are snapping at the heels of the more established firms and you might say well they're more efficient because their wage bill is lower i would say it's a, it's a moral disgrace I, I think there's also um an argument about we're probably violently agreeing with each other that you know we do think at the end of the day if we can get to a um a better standard of living for everyone in the uk so we're just arguing about how we get there um if you look at the parallels with the fair trade campaign where um, the biggest shift, I would argue, is that when the Fairtrade logo became a common household logo that people recognised, um, you wouldn't buy Fairtrade coffee if it tasted lousy, but you might be prepared to pay a bit more because you understood the ethical dividend that you were getting with it. Now, um, our argument is that if businesses of all shapes and sizes and of every sector consider it from that dimension that you want a voluntary movement you want the logo to be everywhere i mean we put it in every single one of our buildings it's always on the reception area so people know when we come in and it's not to it's not if you like to ally our brand with it it's just to to promote the living wage well I, yeah. I'm, I'm very pleased you ally yeah. your brand with it but, I'll um, tell you but, what, just, but the just purpose before, is just to promote the living wage but rather i than think to promote kpmg to be honest with you i think if um, a few Advocates from London citizens or from trade unions representing low-paid workers were saying we should be paying low-paid workers a, a minimum wage, and that, that, they were the only people saying it. Mm. We wouldn't get very far. But when companies like KPMG, when people like David Cameron, someone I don't often agree with, and people like Boris Johnson, shout from the rooftops that actually we should be companies should be looking at the living wage because it makes sense for business, then I think it's time for a lot of businesses to wake up and start looking at this more seriously. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. Joining us in the studio is Mike Kelly, the author of The Living Wage Report. Stephanie Liss is from the Institute of Economic Affairs. And John Page is from the TSSA Union. Mike Kelly, we, we've spoken a lot about the cost to employers, but there's got to be some benefit for employers, surely? The, yes, I mean, there are. There are benefits, as, as we mentioned, around recruitment costs. If you have a more loyal workforce with much lower turnover, I mean... It, it's hard to to talk with anything other than you know KPMG's own example, so I'd apologise for that first of all. But, but you know we know our own business best. Um, over the last four years, the turnover has um, virtually halved from you know forty four percent to twenty seven percent. So that in itself brings uh, quite a significant benefit. You've got um, greater experience, you've got less training, you do end up with less supervision. Um, those being paid the living wage, we do expect more of our people because you know we're paying them more, they're taking on more responsibility, um, there's less oversight for them. But you do also find that, well, you also found that workers who are paid the, the living wage were more motivated in their jobs, Absolutely. they were working harder. Yeah. Um, the best internal statistic we use are the complaints that you get to the telephone helpline from KPMG employees who um, will quite rightly expect a very high standard for everything. Um, and those go down or have gone down quite significantly. So, you know, that is, if you like, a satisfaction level that we uh, adopt as well. Stephanie, Liss, we can't be ignoring these kind of benefits. Of course. And as I keep saying, I think it's desirable. And I'm all for an employer 
to lo- uh, an employee to lobby their employer for better pay. I mean, it's obviously companies should be looking after the well-being of their employees, which is not what I'm saying, but it's just not possible necessarily for small businesses or people that don't, you know, KPMG obviously have much more means than, you know, in a business with eight employees, for example. I mean, the thing, you know, what, what, the reason I'm taking issue here is that I think it's great that it's voluntary, but we're getting to an issue of, of good practice versus law. An issue of good practice is management consultancy. Fantastic. If we're trying to sort of talk about the implement, implementation of a mandatory living wage, that's an issue of politics, and I just don't think that's, that's, that's right. I mean, it's good practice to take your employees out for Christmas lunch. It's not law. Should we make that law? So you don't think we can pressure other low-wage companies to pay more without costing jobs then? We're, oh, well, I suppose technically we're out of recession now, but there's not there's sort of this, this infinite pot of money around to keep raising people's wages. It's unfortunate, but that's just the way, that's just the, way the, situ- the, eco- the econ- economy is and the situation we're in now. No, no, and no. I think we should be focusing, as I said before, on the cost of living, such uh, as house prices. John Page. Uh, I, I wonder whether your organisation comes out and criticises companies when they announce you know, vast uh, boardroom bonuses. Well, you know, I mean, th- there has to be some consistency. But one point I wanted to pick up, which is perhaps not not been discussed really, is, is the whole idea of civil society. My, my experience, and I have some experience both both with the London Citizens Campaign, but also with um, the trade union, is that very often, particularly with cleaners, you're talking about people who are new migrants, who are from ethnic mi- minority communities, often who've ha- been excluded from. Uh, better quality jobs. Often cleaners, it's really quite amazing how different groups of cleaners come from a specific ethnic Mm -hmm. minority community. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ten years ago, I think there was a huge number of people who were Portuguese who were cleaners. There's always been a significant number of African cleaners. And now I think a lot of Eastern Europeans. Very often these are people who who are part of a new migrant community struggling to get their feet on the the ladder in UK uh, UK society. And it makes a world of difference when those communities, who are quite often well organised, begin to get a few extra pence in the bank, because that actually makes a huge difference for their children and and their integration into the wider UK society. So poverty wages actually is an attack on the big society that, that the government is actually promoting. Mike Kelly, would you agree with what you just heard from John Page? I mean, certainly we have different community, well, different community groups within the um, six, seven hundred third-party contractors who operate on our sites. Um, and, yeah, their motivations are different uh, in terms of what they're short-term looking to achieve. When we first introduced the living wage, we also introduced a different um, sickness pay regime and a different holiday regime, uh, and neither of those were abused. We, we also How did they change? Um, they changed in terms of the amount of holiday that people would get. So we, we raised it so that it was a parity to, you know, if you were an employee, that's what you would get. And if you were a third-party contractor, member of staff on our, on our sites, that's what you'd get. So treating them the same way as you would treat all of your employees. Um, but interestingly, uh, there wasn't that interest in looking at pensions. Um, we did run volunteer English la- English language classes because, I mean, we have a very young workforce they use. Uh, a lot of them have been on gap years. They've all got TEFL. Um, so as part of their volunteering in the community, they were running English language classes for our, um, our different supply supply chain staff. But there, there is a different motivation there. There are different sets of groups who work together. We try to take it, the approach that it's all part of the same, you know, homogeneous group, so you don't treat this particular type of supplier contractor on star on site differently than that one because i think what can get forgotten sometimes is that these people will generally be the first person that your customers your clients see when they come into your business you know the security guard at the front or the reception person or you know the um the people who are bringing teas and coffees to meeting rooms and they they're very much the face of you know hundreds of thousands of businesses uh, you know and they're very much setting the tone of what what you want to be as a business. But do you not think that the sort of real poverty in our society lies with those that are out of employment? Absolutely. So then, but, but the implementation you know, of a living wage isn't going to help those outside on, the, on, 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 on the employment ladder. Well, why is it that this government repeatedly says we want to end a situation where people are worse off working than they are on benefits? That I mean, the situation exists today 
that you that there are people, according to the government, who if they take a job on a minimum wage are actually worse off than in receipt of benefit. That's the madness of the current situation. We need to raise uh, people's wages at the bottom. And I, I'm not convinced that actually having moving away from a low-wage economy actually means that we'll have more people out of work. We need to think about public sector investment. Um, rail infrastructure is a perfect example. That with the high speed two is a good example. Where public sector investment by the government can stimulate an economy. We've got an economy at the moment where uh, cut after cut after cut means that people don't feel they've got any money in their pocket to spend and so nobody's spending, so nobody's buying and nobody's actually opening up new jobs. But John Page, the trouble with asking for an increase in people's wages is it's the private employers paying that extra money. It's coming out of their pockets and if they can't afford well, why it... Why should it not? Let's be absolutely clear. If, you're, if you have a, a low-wage economy where we've got something like five, four and a half million people paid below the living wage, each and every one of those, I suspect, has to claim benefits from this government because they can't live on the wages, having worked a full week. So we're subsidising them. I don't see why the employer, who's aiming to make a profit, and presumably is making a profit, should not pay a rate that means that people who have worked a full week don't need to rely on public sector benefits. Stephanie, there is that argument that um, the government is having to pay benefits to people on, on low living wages and they would benefit, perhaps, by um, people earning more money. This is a pre-distribution idea, what, so to save money on giving people higher wages rather than handing it out in tax cuts and benefits afterwards. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I mean, I don't understand where you think this money in the private sector is coming from. I mean, this isn't public money we're talking about. If an employer can't afford to pay his employees a higher rate, where does the money come from? Yeah, yeah, let John um, reply to that. Well, I, I gave the example earlier where, where low-wage jobs force better employers to the wall because they're undercut by the fly-by-night companies. But what about a small family-run shop where they only have a few employees and they can only afford to pay them the minimum wage because otherwise they would go out of business? Surely it's better for them to have a job with a smaller wage than no job at all. Well, that's, that's a very interesting question. But the reality is if you've got a small shop that isn't making enough money to pay people a living wage, then they really need to rethink their business. I mean, so then they'll become unemployed, so then we'll see the unemployment rate rise. Is that what we want? and more people claiming benefits is what, what you don't want people to do. Well, the point I've made three times is that actually, in my experience, in the travel trade in particular, you'll find that the low-wage employers are dri driving out uh, those, those employers that play a decent wage. So it's not a question of either or. It's because it's the race to the bottom. If people say, I can get it cheaper down the road, and the reason they can get it cheaper down the road is because that employer is, is paying poverty wages uh, to their staff, then that's not a good way to build uh, regeneration in, in our industry and our economy. Well, on that note, we will end today's discussion on the living wage. Thank you to all of my guests, Mike Kelly, the author of The Living Wage Report, Stephanie Liss at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and John Page as the national organiser at the TSSA Union. and travel. Uh, I'll begin with you Mike Kelly, um, the author of the Living Wage Report. Should we be adopting the living wage? The report itself sets out the size of the challenge for the UK and there are two aspects to it. The first aspect is the use of the Office of National Statistics Survey which um, sets out the numbers and the occupations that you've described and it also gives you a regional variation so you've got a heat map for where employees are paid less than the living wage across the UK. Um, the second piece of research actually looks at the financial confidence of people, so how they feel about such as major purchases if they are being paid above or below the living wage. Um, we're not advocating that every single person should be paid the living wage from today. Um, what we have said is that it's worthwhile for businesses to consider whether they can afford to pay the living wage and not just treat it as a linear discussion around uh, two different wage rates. Sure. Stephanie Liss from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I think it's very encouraging um, that companies and organisations such as KPMG are looking at a living wage. Um, I think, you know, it's very important for employers to consider their employees' well-being. My main, I think, my main... The CBI says that in the current economic climate, pay restraint is set to continue to protect employment.
Meanwhile, anti-poverty activists say the legal minimum wage is far too low. They want the living wage to be adopted by all employers, but can the country afford it? Joining us for a discussion on the living wage is Mike Kelly. He's the author of the Living Wage Report and the head of corporate social responsibility for KPMG. Stephanie Liss is communications officer at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And John Page is the national organiser at the TSSA Union, which represents people working in trans elves. The figure is higher for London, standing at £8.30. A new report from accountancy firm KPMG has found that 20% of workers in the UK are paid less than those levels. Nearly 90% of waiters and bar staff are not paid the living wage. This rate is voluntary, unlike the national minimum wage, the amount that employers must pay by law, that's set at £6.19 an hour for those aged 21 and over. A separate report from the Confederation of British Industry says that employers need to take a cautious approach to the wages they pay their staff. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. A new report has revealed that nearly 5 million people in Britain don't earn enough to maintain a decent standard of living. Their incomes fall below the level set as the UK living wage by the prominent think tank, the Centre for Research in Social Policy. It says £7.20 is the minimum needed for those in work to support them.